this is the quintessential summer vacation for BC residents. The Okanagan Valley is located in the southern interior of British Columbia. It features a bit of everything, lakes, rolling hills, high mountains, valleys, and desert within its 21,000 square kilometers or 8,000 square miles. We're situated in a valley, so there's a lot of land that we can, you know, explore. Despite its huge size, the Okanagan has only about 350,000 full-time inhabitants. But in summer, that number swells with more than one and a half million tourists. People come here because it's the best weather in all of Canada. End of June until the end of August, the average temperature was anywhere from 28 to 30 degrees Celsius every day of the week. I mean, you just can't beat it. Dramatically beautiful natural surroundings. We have a very thriving agricultural scene. The apple orchards, the peaches, the pears. For people who love food and wine, this is the location. The wine region has just gotten totally insane. The wine is some of the best you'll ever find in the world. Like it's becoming, you know, the wine region of, of the north. Besides the wine and the fresh fruit, Mother Nature's other gift to the region is Lake Okanagan. First and foremost is, is the lake. The lake is very apparent, it's very beautiful, it's, it's very large, uh, provides a lot of recreational activities. Experts can't agree on the origin of the meaning of the word Okanagan. Some Aboriginal people say it's actually several words, one of which means big head. That might explain why some believe this lake is home to more than just water sports. This long, deep, prehistoric lake may be the home of something big, mysterious, frightening, something lying in wait below the surface. Recorded sightings date back to the 19th century. Native people's accounts go back even earlier. Every report confirms there is a sea monster in Lake Okanagan. Those who see it say it's heart-stopping. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Dad, get pictures! This is the beginning of evolution, from shark to, to dinosaur. And this creature is still alive. It's meant to survive. It can swim, it can fly, it can breathe underwater, it can walk on land, it has, it, it has ability to hide. It's unbelievable. It doesn't look like a fish, it doesn't look like a snake. It's sometimes 25 feet long, 30 feet long. It tends to have a greenish color is what people talk about. And it has uh, the face, or the history is that it has the face of a horse. This huge black thing came out of the water probably 40 or 50 feet away. The slimy, kind of shiny, like three, four feet out of the water and big. I mean, this is not a fish. Lake Okanagan covers an area of 350 square kilometers or 135 square miles. The lake is 110 kilometers or 69 miles long and has a maximum depth of 242 meters. That's about 800 feet. That's more than enough natural habitat to support a strange creature with an even stranger name. What is Ogopogo? I mean, it's, we have to admit, it is, a, it is kind of a cute name with all the O's in it, almost like Mississippi, but it's Ogopogo. Ogopogo has never been caught, but people have been catching glimpses of the beast for a very long time. My father had seen it himself. Oh yes, he had seen it himself. Uh, I have, my grandmother has told me stories. I believe that it's possible that there could be something like an Ogopogo in our lake. It really varies what people talk about. Sometimes people don't see the animal at all. What they see is a strange, you know, spout in the water or a strange movement in the lake. 
I would love to see it. I look for it all the time. Ogopogo has been uh, like almost this mythical creature that, uh, you know, that everybody is just fascinated with. Uh, as a newspaper man, I mean, you almost hate to say it, it sells newspapers. Uh, if I hear about a sighting of Ogopogo, it goes front page every single time. My name is Alan Gartrell. I've lived in Penticton since 1944. I have seen the beast. I'll tell you, I was up in Naramata for coffee at Ray Piper's place. It was February the 18th, 1984. There was no wind. The lake was like glass. And he looked out on the lake and he said, who's the idiot out there with a, with a speedboat this time of the year? And I looked at it and I said, it's not a speedboat. I said, that's a head out of the water. It's got a big long neck on it, probably about 14, 16 foot neck on it. I started looking at it with my binoculars and when I started looking, it dove and it thrust with all four flippers. I went away down in the bottom of the lake, did a circle down there and came up right up the center and took fish off just about 10 feet from the top of the water. It did it 17 times for us. We had a real picture show in front of us and we did not have a camera. Just by what I saw, it looked like it had the power of two workhorses. It's real strong. In my books, it has to weigh probably 1,500 pounds. It's big. It's a 12 or 13 foot body on it. Its flippers have to be at least six feet long. Nobody gets a chance to see something like that. I took my brother-in-law and my daughter down the beach in kayaks, 2009. So I do a U-turn uh, at this underwater ledge, and uh, the water's a little bit stirred up, but there's this orange-like creature under my kayak, uh, as big as my 18-foot kayak, and it's as wide as long, and, and, and I keep paddling, because I was afraid. It was right there. I have a picture of me uh, in a kayak, and beyond me is, is an object surfacing just, just a kilometer down the beach. And this object, in, by scanning in the negative, looked like some kind of a, a alligator coming out of the water, uh, just sort of with its mouth open. I, I, I was very afraid. When I had my first sighting in 78, I, at that point in time, I was a, I was a skeptic, I, I'll have to admit. I didn't believe in Ogopogo. I was going to work. I lived on the west side at the time, and I was coming down the west side of the bridge. And as I'm going across the bridge to Kelowna, to the east, I look over, and couldn't believe there was something in the water, and it was traveling parallel to the bridge. So I stopped my car. I stopped my car, put the four-way flashers on, and of course there was traffic coming down the hill behind me. They all came and parked behind me. I get out over the railing, and what I'm seeing is three black humps moving parallel with the bridge towards Kelowna with what looked to me like a head going in and out of the water in the front. And I looked down, I looked to my right, and there had to be 40 people seeing the same thing with the cars all backed up. So anyway, I was all excited, and then it disappeared. Saw it for about 30 seconds. Bill Stechiak is among hundreds of eyewitnesses who include the earliest European settlers that arrived in the Okanagan Valley in 1811. But the first reports of a lake monster go back much further. Native peoples left behind many pictographs and oral histories of their first-hand experiences. What I find fascinating is the pictographs. Uh, that were drawn by the First Nations peoples. They obviously saw the same thing that people are seeing today and wanted to portray something that was so unusual, so fascinating to them that they wanted to document it. I mean, it's the equivalent to us going out and shooting video or shooting still photographs.
White Haskell Hulk, he squeezed Jordan Kobo, couldn't tell Satu Hunut. Uh, we have always referred to the Ogopogo as Nkhakaik, which translates to the spirit of the lake. Our people know that there's more out there than just a lake. There's something in there that's, that's really deep and really meaningful to who we are as a people. Native elders have passed down stories about nomadic tribes offering sage and tobacco to Hoktik, the monster, in exchange for permission to cross the lake during their seasonal migrations. In return, Hoktik would calm the water for their safe passage. But one day, according to the legend, a tribal chief ignored the lake creature and refused to make the ritual offering. That had not been done. And so, and therefore, the lake really started, went from a nice, calm, peaceful setting to a really alive, really kind of daunting, scary lake. Uh, the waves can get rather high for being an inland lake. Um, and it was really dark, really cold. And Chief Kikinsula instructed his people to let go of the horses, to uh, get across the lake as, as quickly as possible because there was something in the water that was not uh, being respected at the time. And as they were doing that, they heard the horses weaning. Um, some of the horses ended up going underwater, and they made it across the lake, but the horses had scars. Um, it looked like giant claw marks on their, the torsos of their bodies. Uh, some had bite marks in their bodies. When the first settlers arrived, you have to remember what the Okanagan was like. It was basically wild country. It was like what you would find if you went in, into northern British Columbia right now. So that when settlers came here, I mean, they were living right at the edge of the big forest. They had no idea what was here, what wasn't here. And it's stories about a lake creature that they got from the, uh, from the First Nations people probably scared the bejesus out of them. They believed the native stories and there were many um, frightful occurrences, many sightings. They actually posted armed guards on the uh, shores of Okanagan Lake. Used to patrol the beaches with their muskets uh, to protect their families, or they tried to capture it by running hooks out into the lake. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. These are tough people. I mean, hello, you know. So they must have seen something, and they, and they were very, very upset. They didn't know what to think, uh, but from the First Nations people, they had to take this as, as a serious threat. Locals and legends claim that a mysterious monster has been lurking in the depths of Lake Okanagan for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. But how did it get here? What is it? And how has it managed to survive all this time without ever being captured? This lake has a prehistoric history, and uh, 10,000 years ago, it was quite a bit higher and longer than it is now, so all of this would have been underwater. So the theory is, is that many years ago, when this was open to the sea, uh, Ogopogo uh, came up and got into Okanagan Lake, chasing the salmon. When the glacier receded, it left behind a long, deep and narrow valley that filled with water as the ice melted. It gradually cut off access from the lake to the sea. Bill Stechuk believes Ogopogo is a prehistoric animal that became trapped in the lake. Got landlocked here and then, uh, kind of lived here and kind of adapted to where he was. Species are either well adapted to an environment, in which case they persist, or they're not, and they die. They wow. become extinct. One animal which proves the theory that some species can adapt to a radically different environment is the kokanee salmon, found only in Lake Okanagan and its tributaries. It's a landlocked salmon, and they still spawn in the uh, creeks in the area, along the shorelines. It's a very interesting phenomenon because, of course, these fish came from the sockeye that used to be able to make it out to the ocean. So there is that question. Could there be something um, in the water that we don't know about? It's a very deep lake. 
About 100 million years ago, the Plesiosaurus, a marine dinosaur with a long neck, flippers, and a stubby tail, lived in what is now the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of North America. Descriptions of Ogopogo bear an uncanny resemblance to the prehistoric Plesiosaurus. But there are other theories also. Some would say it's a very old species, in other words, one that was thought to be extinct, uh, but turned out not to be. And others would say Ogopogo and Loch Ness monsters were a new species in the sense that it was one un unknown to science. There's all kinds of species being found all the time, new ones, probably every week all over the world. And, you know, why couldn't something live here in the lake? Why couldn't the species in this body of water that's 90 miles long, it's incredible. It's four, it's two and a half miles wide. It's one of the deepest lakes in North America. Why couldn't something live here that hasn't been found? By restricting their search for Ogopogo only to the lake itself, hunters might be missing a creature that is living literally right under their feet. The Western perspective of Ogopogo, and I, and I fall victim to this all the time, is that because it's such a large creature that it, it's a male, they refer to Ogopogo as he all the time, and I, I definitely fall victim to that as well. Um, but our people tell stories of seeing multiple Ogopogos, which means that there has to be, you know, Science proves it has to be a male and female to, to uh, recreate more Ogopogos or more Nkaka'it. Um, and there's stories of the Ogopogo being on, on beaches and even appendages to, to walk on the land with. Well, this is Pebble Beach. This is West Kelowna. Just down the beach is beach land. Andrew Bennett has developed a theory about how Ogopogo's been able to survive here for centuries. In the late 90s, he was leading a tour of native pictographs with a local Boy Scout troop when a small, unusual-looking salamander crossed their trail. When I saw this creature running uh, from the Boy Scouts, it was very timid and darted out of, out of view very fast. It did not fit any description or any picture that I was ever, ever able to find. My, my thought is it is not a salamander. This is really... Uh, the part of the, the stage of this creature to, to be born on land and then go back into the water. Uh, life cycle. Andrew believes they had stumbled upon a newborn Ogopogo that day, heading towards the water, like young turtles do soon after they hatch. This encounter piqued his curiosity. If Ogopogo has a nearby nest, he'll try to find it. Just was going over in my mind, there must be some more, some more to this spot. A few weeks later, Andrew Bennett returns to the same location, this time armed with a camera and determined to record some hard evidence. Bennett takes a series of photos he says proves Ogopogo laid a nest here. He keeps his distance so that he doesn't disturb the site or scare away the creature. He also photographs the nearby shoreline where Ogopogo likely exits and enters the lake. Uh, I took pictures underwater pictures what looked like logs and and then I was going through my pictures and and uh, realizing oh maybe there's something more to it and then I realized that, that this was not a log this was a creature it had a, a flipper obviously that looked like Ogopogo it, it was long it's only maybe a foot wide and maybe 18 feet long and uh, and a closer examination you can see an eye and a lizard head and a tongue sticking out I didn't know before that it was so lizard-like, but anyway, that's what, what seemed to come out in the pictures. Later, Bennett enlarges his high-resolution photos and discovers what he believes is evidence of newly hatched Ogopogos, like this one. And this one, a single unhatched egg on a pile of debris. There's an egg and a creature coming out of it, still hatching. And, and then there's all these young ones all around it, all very well camouflaged. Its orange color is hid by the orange leaves in the crevice. It's really, really good camouflage. Bennett concludes that Ogopogos are masters of disguise. You would swear it was a log. 
and you would see these pictures, you would swear they're logs, but they really aren't. There, there's an eye, there's a nostril, there's a tongue sticking out. There's, there, there's details that just aren't in logs. Uh, this camouflage has evolved over millions of years, and, and it, it is almost perfect. It just can sit there. Even a shark has a hard time sitting in one place uh, for more than half an hour, but this creature can sit there for hours and, and just pretend it's a log. And, and then the the, uh, the part of it that tells you that it's not a log is you, if you go back there, the log is gone. Like some of his other photos of driftwood and logs, Bennett believes this one is unmistakably Ogopogo on the move. Uh, and, and this is its home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. So the last four or five years, I think, in many pictures of this area, and I'm convinced this is the home of Ogopogo. Bennett's photos lead him to one startling conclusion. Ogopogo isn't one animal. There's an entire species thriving in Lake Okanagan. Uh, a few years ago, I took a picture of the head peeping out of a cave on the bottom of the lake, about 14 feet under. And it looks just like Ogopogo. Skeptics see another interpretation in Bennett's photos. There's lots of trees around Lake Okanagan. Floating and sunken logs are commonplace. One of the first reports to mistake a drifting log for a monster dates back 140 years. A Mrs. Susan Allison had a sighting and she saw this object which she thought was a pine trunk, a, a, a tree trunk, but then she saw it was moving against the wind. Nevertheless, Bennett is convinced some moving objects are the creature cruising on the surface, perhaps on the hunt. Any kind of dinosaur-like creature that has lived that long can obviously quickly destroy a person, so uh, I did not want to experiment by lifting it up. Um, it just seemed too dangerous. And even though it, it has its, its advantage in its, in its camouflage, my fear is uh, that, that the, eventually uh, the creature will be hunted, and that would not be my wish. My wish is, is that the, the species at risk would identify the creature and then protect it. Eyewitnesses, fuzzy photographs, and a handful of theories, but no corpse has turned up on the shores of Lake Okanagan. Without that, Ogopogo the lake monster remains a myth. The more recent pictures that you see, none of those pictures really have been scientifically verified as Ogopogo, but there is definitely, you know, those, those are pictures of the lake that people don't take every day and don't see every day, so. Bill Stechuk never forgot the time he spotted Ogopogo back in 1978. It was so intense that he decides to recreate that day in a short film. What we were doing is we were reenacting what my first sighting in 1978. And of course, I was a little younger then, so my son played me. Incredibly, Stechuk doesn't have to restage the main event. And out of the blue, something appears in the lake. Look at the three humps. One, two, three. You mean those glistening waves? That is not a wave. You think, I mean, what are the chances? You know, it's like, it's so rare to see Ogopogo, and he shows up for a film crew. And we had all the extras there, the film crew. We had 14 people there. It wasn't one person who saw this. 14 people. Look at it move. And everybody starts screaming, and they're turning the television cameras towards it. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Whoa, wait a minute. Are you filming this? And it, the most incredible part of it is nobody is acting in this. They're looking at this, and we've got the audio, and it's the most incredible audio you've ever heard. Really, really good stuff. I don't know what to say other than my breath was taken away. I started freaking out, basically. <laughs> Dad, get pictures! Hello. <laughs> there was obviously something there that wasn't natural that 
wasn't quite proof, but was so tantalizing as to, you know, as to make the day, make the week, make the production for that film crew. We saw something. Convinced that what he filmed was the lake monster, in 1999, Stechuk assembles a research team and spends three weeks on the lake looking for scientific evidence. It was great. We had 75 people involved. We spent three weeks on the lake, and we got some really good results. With a houseboat, a team of divers, sonar, underwater submersibles, and cameras, Stechuk conducts the most intense scientific expedition ever assembled. The investigation begins here at Rattlesnake Island and Squally Point. Native legends point to this area as the Ogopogo hotspot. It's just a small island that the First Nations used for their sacrifices to Ogopogo. And uh, I guess at one time they had a lot of rattlesnakes on it, so <laughs> that's why it got its name. Divers go down to a depth of 100 feet looking for a cave and signs of the beast. And that's where you've got these sheer drop-off, these sheer walls that go down like two, 300 feet, which is just incredible. This cave was at 100 feet down. It was about 14 feet wide, and there was actual colder water coming out of the cave into the lake from some kind of underground spring or whatever. Would the cave lead the divers to another body of water? Perhaps Lake Okanagan isn't landlocked at all and actually connects to the Pacific Ocean. They don't know how far that cave goes in. And Bill Stasiak said that he's got his divers had went into the cave and there's too much water coming out of the cave and makes it too hard for the divers to swim into the cave. Our divers, of course, they, they get a little panicky and they didn't go very far in, so who knows what's in there? And that's just one, one cave on the wall. So there are other places in the lake where water is entering. Really interesting stuff. The first stage of the expedition gives the team some intriguing but inconclusive evidence. The next stop, however, propels the venture into high gear. Hey, Bill, there's something on the soda over here. What? Yeah, look at that. They had this the side scan sonar, which is a quite an advanced type of sonar. Sonar emits sound waves, which strike an underwater target and rebound back to the transmitter. These waves appear on the sonar screen as images. The team is now looking at something moving slowly across the bottom of the lake. There is something in the water. That sound would not have been bounced back if it didn't hit an object. They found something two to 300 feet down in the water, something huge that there was no way it could be a, a, a bunch of fish. And they said, you know, we don't know what it is, but there's something there. I guess we better get the ROV down, man. Okay. Wasting no time, the team deploys the ROV, a remotely operated vehicle and camera. We estimate that the target itself was 17 meters long. But the ROV arrives too late. Huge, and then disappeared. Yeah, it was like 266 okay. feet of water. Then it was right there. There were 10 degrees. Uh, we had it on two sweeps of the sonar. Uh, the third sweep, it went below our beam, and we lost it. But whatever that was, was huge, and it was a solid sonar return, and it was moving. It moved 10 degrees, port to starboard. This could be Ogopogo. Could be, but not good enough as hard data. More weeks of intense searching turns up nothing. If Ogopogo does exist, it got away once again. As far as I know, nobody has ever actually produced scientific evidence. I mean, there's been $1 million and $2 million rewards for proof of the existence of Ogopogo, and nobody has claimed the reward. We've had people all through the years come and see if they can find something and, and uh, find definitive evidence of the existence of Ogopogo, but uh, it has remained elusive.
There are some people who absolutely say, I've seen something, I can't explain it. Um, and then you get those that say, absolutely not, it's just a big fish or it's a current or whatever. In general, I'm a skeptic. Uh, that's sort of a, a lifestyle. I feel like coming here and talking about Ogopogo like this, I'll be the equivalent to the guy who told your kid there's no Santa Claus. You know, sorry to those who uh, may be, might be upset by this. There's a lot of people that believe Ogopogo is just a giant sturgeon. Um, I guess that could be a kind of a scientific analysis of the Ogopogo. The beaver. <laughs> I would liken it to, to the Santa Claus story. Oh, well, I've born and raised here. I've never seen it. <laughs> At least not when I was sober, but... <laughs> I think it's a wave. <laughs> My grandfather used to swear he's seen it, but he intended to BS a little bit, so. It's an old lake. It's a really deep lake. So I suppose there could be something, but I think it's just a big fish. I don't know. Gopogo himself seems to be a bit of a tease. It's like, come up and just show myself briefly and, uh, and tease the tourists, and then I'll disappear and leave them wondering. Was it really a Gopogo, or was it a fish, or was it just a series of waves? Witnesses, in general, are honest. They are reporting also, in my experience, more or less what they're seeing. But actually, it's a mistaken conclusion. Often, cameras do lie. Sometimes it's because deliberate hoaxes are, are made. And sometimes it's because a picture is taken which is a little bit ambiguous and then perhaps people begin to attach importance to it. I come on this trail 50 to 100 times a year, and I sometimes see unusual waves in the middle of the lake. And, and, and one day I was walking along and I saw one, and there were four people coming along behind me. And I stopped and I said, what do you think of that over there? And they stopped and they said, oh, wow, that's a humongous animal under there. Uh, and uh, I said, well, or it's just, a standing wave in a quiet lake. There's a lot of scientists that say that it's just, it's just waves, okay? And, and certainly, there are waves, and people take pictures of waves. Motorboats, large fish, and swimmers cause waves. But according to eyewitnesses, some waves defy all logic. Skeptics, you know, you can't blame people for being skeptical. But at the same time, there are humps, and there are heads, and it's moving through the water. And what about the waves that appear from nowhere? They're the hardest phenomenon to explain away. Our lake is, is calm and flat. And then all of a sudden, you get this, this w wave coming from the middle of nowhere in the middle of the lake. That where did it come from? It's just like in the middle. Yeah. And it's this big rolling thing that could look like a monster. I don't know. <laughs> it has to be the monster. It just has to be. What else could it be? <laughs> well, we see a wave, but there's no boat. It must be an animal, OK? And well, there are other things that it could be. There's pockets of methane gas in the sediment, and it releases instantaneous, uh, which causes all kinds of bubbling and, wa and steaming at the surface. Uh, and that's been seen many times, and that's also uh, been taken for a sighting of Ogopogo. It's as much a process of rationalization as imagination. So, for example, these logs which move upwind uh, can be caused by what are known as seiches, internal seiches, whereby the warm water from a summer's warming can be pushed by the wind to one end of a lake and then will flow back again, causing underwater waves. Now, you don't really see those waves at the surface, but if there's an object on the surface, like a tree trunk, then it will move against the wind. And you need to, a little bit of general science to understand that. We know from the physics that fluids moving in a gravitational field will form something called a gravity wave, created simply because of the difference in temperature. When that corrects, the uh, water will actually start to form waves. The other questions you can ask, too. 
that there's some sort of submarine cave linking all of these things is geologically ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it would have to go under major mountain passes and thrust systems and volcanic terrains and things. I mean, you know, uh, number one. And number two is it's supposedly an air-breathing animal. And uh, how is it going to swim hundreds and hundreds of kilometers underwater without access to the air? People will scoff and laugh, but everybody that, that, that's seen something in the lake has been ridiculed. But you, you just have to take it because it's a real thing. Uh, people laugh at me when I tell them what I saw, but they can laugh all they want. What I saw, I saw. The last fella told me, he says, yo, you probably saw that beaver out in the lake. Well, it's, it's 3,000 times bigger than a beaver. <laughs> I think if you believe in dinosaurs and all of the things that are now extinct, you have to believe that there could be something like that still living in a deep, deep lake like the Okanagan Lake. Finding that scientific proof is something that some people need. Um, our people, the West Bank First Nation people, the seal people of this area, uh, don't believe that you need to see something to believe it. All of us want to believe. I think it's wonderful to have the myth. I think Santa or, or the Okanagan is is a great addition to Kelowna's story. Do I believe in it? No, but I'm not going to debunk the myth because I think the myth is fun. The days of being afraid to go swimming in Lake Okanagan or making ritual sacrifices to a lake monster named Ogopogo are a thing of the past. These days, the creature has resurfaced again, not as a beast, but as tourism's best friend. The creature that, that was feared by the early settlers is not the creature that we see now. We see this fuzzy green toy in the department store, so there's this very benign creature, which is not what the experience of the early settlers was. Rebranding a lake monster into something the tourist industry can sink its teeth into involved a name change. The original native word, Hoktik, lacked a touch of playfulness. And basically, people didn't like the native name, I guess, back in the beginning, and they came up with this Ogopogo name from a song. They took a British dance hall ditty. His mother was an earwig, his father was a, and I can't remember the rest of it. And it just became sort of everybody's pet project. And when you see this little creature at, in, encased in cement at the foot of the main street, uh, the children are climbing all over it and absolutely nobody's afraid of it. Of course we don't talk about sacrifices to the monster. <laughs> Since nobody's ever died from him or her or whatever, I think he's friendly. <laughs> he's got the smiley face and everything else, OK? Towns and cities around Lake Okanagan have all adopted the colorful and cuddly monster as their own. Of course, there's also a commercialized aspect of Ogopogo, uh, the more cuddly, um, you know, stuffed animal version of Ogopogo that uh, you can purchase in the tourist centers and stuff like that. Lots of people look for Ogopogo, and they're, you know, very sane people. And I believe there's something in the lake. He's a friendly fella. He hasn't eaten too many tourists yet. He doesn't eat people. He eats plants. He eats ice cream at Ogos. <laughs> My name is Sharon Brown, and I live in Penticton, BC, where I run and own an ice cream shop called Ogo's Ice Cream. We have our ice cream that's named after Ogo Pogo. It's a vanilla, black licorice, orange ice cream. Very bright and colorful. The kids really love it because of its color. People come in, they're happy. They're coming for a happy experience. And it's a really, really happy place to be. The people love the monster. You know, Okanagan Lake and the Ogopogo. It's what, what the lake's about. Certainly we have 
images of Ogopogo all around town. We have a mosaic of Ogopogo. Um, you'll see businesses that are called Ogopogo whatever. There's an Ogopogo Rotary Club. There's an Ogopogo Swim Club. There's the Ogopogo Zone of the Canadian Ski Patrol Club. Ogopogo Tours, you know? We'll take you out on the lake and there's a chance you can see Ogopogo. It's a great marketing tool. Keep your eyes open because you never know. You never know when he could appear. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a great tourist promotion. I own and operate a bed and breakfast and it's called Ogopogo. Ogopogo B&B, perfect place to be, you know? The, the sales has become almost emblem, emblematic of Kelowna. It's used in the city logo. It's used on all, all kinds of different stationery. It's, it's kind of become the sim, symbol of Kelowna. But then right beside it, they see the Ogopogo. It's a focal point for the tourists. If people want to believe there's an Ogopogo, it's great. I love this place. So yeah. it brings people to look for an Ogopogo, sure. The jury's still out on whether Lake Okanagan has a man-eating sea monster or a shy prehistoric vegetarian. Then again, it may be only a great story to attract tourists. In any case, Ogopogo has become an integral part of the breathtaking scenery. Yet it may be more than that. There's so much deep water stretching for over 100 kilometers or nearly 70 miles that no one should completely write off the possibility Ogopogo does exist. People may come to try to find Ogopogo, exploring the depths of, of Okanagan Lake. But it's not something that has to be feared. It's something to be respected, and, and it has to be believed in to, to really experience it, I think. I think it's actually kind of neat that nobody's been able to prove or disprove that there is an Ogopogo. I mean, people love the stories. People read the stories. They're, they're avid followers of Ogopogo. They, they, they'd, like, you know, they'd like nothing better to know that he exists, but at the same time, it's kind of neat that he, there's been no proof because the myth goes on. There's been an incredible change in, uh, in attitude with people about Ogopogo, and, and I've seen that over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's less skeptics now. Uh, I think people are starting to come to grips with the fact that, you know, there, there, could, have, there could be an animal that lives in this lake. Uh, there, we're certainly finding new species all over the world almost every week that we didn't know existed. It's a great draw for Kelowna. Uh, and the fact that there's actually something here is just remarkable. Uh, and, and this is his home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. This deserves to be protected. Ogopogo has plenty of fans who believe in it and want it left alone. Even the creature itself is never caught. People who visit Lake Okanagan are definitely hooked. Ogopogo's unpredictable. You never know when he's going to show up. And of course, he's always going to show up when the camera's not ready, when the camera's not focused, when you left the camera in the car. He always seems to show up when you're least likely to be able to provide proof that he exists. They're looking to find that, that, that scientific proof that Ogopogo exists. And I don't think that's really necessary, but you know, it keeps the spirit alive. It is an ongoing story. Um, you know, I might not find the, the scientific evidence to prove that, but there, it's, it's something that I believe in my heart and what my elders have always taught me is that if you believe it in your heart to be true, then it can't be wrong. <laughs>